Hi, Carrie. Hi. How are you? Good. Thanks for taking the time um, to chat. Thanks for having me here. It is really nice. Uh, where are you calling in from? London. Nice. Yeah. Sunny, cloudy. What's going on over there? It's a bit overcast today, but it's really hot here, actually. I'm surprised. Damn. Like, people, British people don't know what to do when it's hot outside. Yeah. <laughs> so I keep hearing, but I'm, you know, I like the heat. <laughs> I like it better, much better than the cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in Barcelona, and it's pretty, not, a little overcast, but nice and toasty, so. Very cool. Love. One of my favorite places, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, I love Barcelona. Uh, do you have a club that you play at here, usually, or previously? Oh, man, for years. Uh, I don't even know what my favorite club is. I think my, my favorite thing in Barcelona is all the architecture. I think that's what really makes me happy. Just even seeing all the Gaudi stuff and even walking around the, the just wild things that happen there. And I always have a lot of really interesting parties there. I, I mean, I've, I've done bull rings and crazy things there. So it's hard to say which, which uh, actual venue was my favorite. Though. So it's just, it's been years, it's early 90s. So That's so cool. Uh, yeah, I love Barcelona too. I'm here for Sonar, which I'm assuming you've played. I love it actually. Oh, I straight myself out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, get comfortable. We're gonna we're gonna dive in here. Um, okay, so I'll start with like um, more recent. <laughs> Hold on for a second. Okay. Okay. Right. No, I'm better, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, you know on um, voice notes where it'll like just automatically name it like the address. Okay. Uh, so it so it just says super freaky market. <laughs> super freaky market. <laughs> what is that? I have no idea, but I need to go find out. Where I need to go find out. <laughs> super freaky market. Um, I don't to that super freaky market. <laughs> but it's spelled like F R I K I. I don't know. I need to do some investigating after this. What is that? <laughs> it sounds like some place I don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so music. Um, okay. Your latest uh, super recent release is the classic house Groover all about love on the house of Ibiza compilation. So yeah, like what kind of mood and setting were you, um, all about love. Is that, is that not true? Well, it's very, very old. I did that back in like early yeah. 2000, not even 2000s. I don't remember 1998. That's probably relicensed. And if anything, that's why it sounds classic. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it is. That's, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah that was on King Street years and years ago. I, I don't know why. Or maybe they just relicensed it to a compilation. Oh, yeah. Okay, that that must be what it is, because it's like the your top your or your most recent track on SoundCloud. Um, really? That's so funny. I was like. I was like, this is so classic. I love it. But um, no, the okay. last thing I, I did was, um, let me get it right now. My album, mm -hmm. the three album was the last thing. And I, and I released a few singles off of that. Um, the, the, the Lost EP, number two, volume two. And that was maybe about a month ago. Yeah. Well, since I asked about this track or was listening to this track, um, yeah, what, when is it actually from? And yeah, what was, do you remember like what kind of like vibe or mood you were conjuring while uh, working on that? I don't even remember. It's been so long ago. That was like 20 years ago, at least 23 years ago, Damn. at least. Um, my mind frame was just make some really cool music and things I, I enjoy to play and just uh, having a good time with it. Just like electronically, the tones of it. And um, at the time, I was just thinking the world needs more love, and that's where it came from. Maybe that's why they re-released it. It's still, yeah. it's, it's still like I said. It's one of my one of my favorite tracks. People ask me about it all the time when they play it. So, but yeah, that was at least twenty twenty three years ago. 
and surprises. You now have to call King Street and ask them, hey, when did you license this thing? Again, without telling me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not getting anyone in trouble. <laughs> oh, no, he's, 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 you know, he knows. <laughs> he knows he has to, like, take care of things. But it's nice to know what compilation it is now, if it's actually happened again. It, supposedly it says it's on House of Ibiza 2023. So oh, it, was the year, nice. it was the year that threw me off. Yeah, it's so funny. I Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> I know how I need to make a phone call to. <laughs> okay, that's that's your research you're doing after this call. We both yeah, have. absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, and, you know, when you're working on a track, like, where do you usually start or does it just kind of depend like well, how do you know when you're done when you start adding things to a track and it feels like it's taking away from it that's what i usually um i have my premise on if i add more things to it and i think it feels like i want to add more things but then it starts taking away from the the, the groove of the track that's mm -hmm. when i know i've gone too far and i need to strip it back some more like even vocals, I've learned that early on. It's like too many vocals are too many vocals. You know, you don't need all of that. When you make dance music, you have to make people dance. You know, I'm not making songs for the radio or any of that kind of stuff. I'm making it for clubs for people that really want to release and let go and do dance. You know, dance. You know, they want to come and forget. And that's why I like making songs for forget or make you think. And it's. Well, I think Deep House actually is it makes you think. Not just in tonal, you know, sounds and things. It's a matter of does this music make you feel something? Can you relate to it? You know, does it make you think? Can you relate to it? And can you dance to it at the same time? Oh, I love that. Deep Deep House for the mind. Mm. It is. It's, that's how I've always thought about it. Every song I've ever made, there's a story behind each one. I, I can't really write a song without, I just don't go to studio, I'm gonna make this. But there's something that happened in my life for each song. And that that's how I um, approach it. I've always approached it that way. Mm. Are you like always working on music or do you have kind of set times where you're like, okay, I need to go back to the studio or? I only go when I feel like I have something to say. Hmm. If there's something on my mind, I'll wake up early in the morning and just run into the studio. And I'm touring a lot, so sometimes I take my gear with me. I think the most fun I've had so far has been um, this whole Spaces and Places album because I did them all in clubs. So every time um, I went in, I got inspired by a particular club. And that, that would give me, you know, a good time for for creating in a space that was unique to the sound I needed. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about that album because it really does feel special because not so, only... Well, okay. Thank you. Um, just a second. Are you editing this? Yeah, I will not be, but someone that someone will. Yeah, just so like, I'm sure they can. Yeah, just let me know mm -hmm. when it gets loud and we'll pause. Yeah, just linear people walking around this lounge room. Okay. Are they singing at you again? <laughs> no, well, these are older uh, men and women going in like a nice older couple. Cute. I'm trying to figure out the door. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we're back. Um, yeah, yeah, I did want to, um, talk about spaces and places because it just feels really special that not only were the tracks inspired by these spaces, these clubs that you love, but that you recorded them there. Yeah. Um, and some of them have since shuttered, which is yeah. sad and like, cause not even that long ago, but yeah, my question was sort of like, what, what are your thoughts? or feelings on like the club as like a sacred cultural space? Um, I think each place is, um, for each club, it has memories. And mm. a lot of people that go there, that's their way to, like I said, you know, be free and set things loose and have a good time. 
You know, that's their other home in a way. You know, they meet with their friends, you know, rather than, you know, being on, you know, the phone or communicating through Instagram or one of these social media things. They're not just looking at their phone. They're going there to hang out and socialize. You know, there's some people that are there to dance. There's some there are people there to, you know, just want to have a good time. There, there's some people there that want to meet people. You know, there's some people there that just want to hear good music. And there's people that just want to hear the DJ. You know, I hear a group of DJs. And I like the, the spontaneous um, feeling of each club. And each one has something different because of the culture and the people that come there. Mm. You know, and that, that's always been what I've seen. It's like, it's like in some ways, it's like back where we lived, it was kind of our church. You know, so we, there was this where we come to just let loose and set free. You know, this, there were so many clubs in New York, and I, and I was very blessed to play pretty much all of them. You know, and then, like New Jersey, same thing. We had Sounds of Art, Club 88, Club America. Same thing. I mean, frequented those, played those. Um, 1018, Red Zone, Mars, you know, Tunnel, Shelter. Uh, there was so many. That I could call home, Mel's, you know, and they were—they're were all infamous, amazing clubs, and you know, majority of them closed. They try to reopen a few, and just you know, they, they waver at that. And things open and things close with each generation. Mm. You know, my, the sad thing for me is watching things turn into, um, you know, living spaces. They'll turn into condominiums, or they'll turn into some kind of useless business. You know, it's like print works to me. It's like yeah. One of my favorite places I've ever been to, just even walk in there, it felt incredible. Mm. And um, just even the story behind that one, just that one song. Um, I went there, there was this piano upstairs. This is what I was saying about individual things that happened in some of these clubs. There was a green room upstairs, and uh, there was a piano up there, a yellow, ugly piano that everybody just signed, like all the DJs. I wonder if they would go auction it off for a charity or something. I think that'd be really good if they actually did something like that. Should actually call someone and tell them, you know, maybe they should go someplace and do that. But all the DJs that played there signed this piano. And I went on a, a few off days to go there because that's when they scheduled me in to do uh, the song for the album. And when I went in, uh, I, the first thing I asked was freezing in there. I said, can I, um, I want to record the, the yellow ugly piano and can you, um, you know, can I have access to it? No one even knew what I was talking about. And I said, yeah, it was upstairs. We got to this and this, and we got to climb up. And I brought my recorder upstairs and just recorded the ugly piano, ugly yellow piano. And I did something even different. When everyone signed the outside of the piano, I lifted the, the lid on the piano, and I actually wrote, Kerry was here underneath the piano list. So that was my, my, my kind of contribution to the piano. But I ended up using it in the song that I made for uh, Spaces and Places. And then I went downstairs and pretty much tailor-made um, the time for the song and the signature, and the, even the way it echoed off of the, the walls and the speakers um, to fit the club exactly. So if you hear the song in that club, it's pretty much tailor-made to it. It's like mm -hmm. every other song I've done on the album. But when it translates to other clubs and you hear it, it's really like, wow, okay, this pretty much works really well everywhere. It's so cool. Yeah, I'm really sad that I didn't get to go to print work. Yeah, no, it, it, was, it was an incredible place, and I'm going to miss it. But they're opening, uh, they actually did another one, but they're going to open another version of that. Yeah. Yeah. Print work someplace else, from what I understand anyway. So it's, you're losing the building, but not the actual events. Yeah. Um, yeah, The one of the... New York clubs that I like was lucky to go to um, was Output. And I just like which one? Output. Oh yeah, and, uh, and then, another one with the rooftop, especially. That was one of my other favorites to play in New York. Yeah, like that. That was one of those spaces. I just like showed up, and did it. You know, didn't live there. Hadn't really gone out much in New York before. It was just like wow. There's, like there's this another is... one I, I love to get away. Remember it was Santos Party House. I don't know if you've ever been there. Which one? Santos Party House. Mm -mm. Oh, that was that's one of my favorites. Too. Absolutely cool place. And um, just good and just incredible sound system. And, 
Yeah. Really, really great vibe with the people there. All of my um, beta testing and prototypes I used to do at their club. All my holograms and lasers and real to real stuff. And, you know, they, they would really just let me do what I wanted to do in that. And I test it there in that club, like all the things that I'm working on. And, um, yeah, I just find that so fun. That's so cool. Um, yeah, and what clubs uh, these days, like, kind of still evoke that kind of, like, your, like, like classic, like, house, like, 80s, well, 90s York. for you? If I can say New York, definitely um, Knocked Out Soul. Mm. That's probably my favorite. That's that's definitely those guys in there are just they're like family and I absolutely love that place. Um see, around the world, I mean it's I've got tons of magazine and generalities and all actually I can just say pretty much every record that I've done on my album are my favorites. They really are. I mean they're they're there for reasons self club. I mean I, I I would never leave out the clubs I really love and that's what I did. I got really lucky that every one of those clubs were like, you know, family there. Like every single one in there was, what is it, Sons Beat, which was out in Croatia. And wow, I mean, there, I gotta say, every single club on my album, I got to do all of them. And even some of the ones that were closed down, I actually did recordings at them. And they, um, you know, I actually had a couple of recordings from stuff I did there live years ago. And um, yeah, I just got really, really blessed. I still have some of the recordings. That's cool. Um, yeah, and then what do you think, like, you know, to your point about, like, print works and stuff, like, what do you think can be done to sort of, like, better protect venues as cultural institutions? I think a lot of it has to do with ownership mm. of, of the actual property itself, because a lot of these places they lease or rent them, and then wild or, or, or the, I think a lot of it has to do with the environment around a lot of this stuff gets closed down because of noise or like you know the, the neighbors or something like that you know there's a noise ordinance or someone in the city complains that they don't want this thing next door to them or you know something happens or there's some kind of instance let's just say it that way that would happen and it would shut it down it could be anything from a, a fight to fire, you know, and nobody wants any loss of life or problem or anything like that. And, you know, just even being druggy, you know, it's like when things get out of hand, that's when clubs disappear. Mm. It's either greed or, or something happened that couldn't have happened. And then, you know, people get older, they have lives that they want, you know, and they go back to the same club or the same place, and it just happens. You know. But the ones that do last, like, for instance, sub club. It's, it's, uh, it's been around since I've you know, pretty much started traveling. Ministry of Sound, it's just an institution. You know, some of these places, when they do it, they do it right, and they figure out how to make it you know, stay, and, you know, get ready for the next generation. And the first club I've ever played abroad was Ministry of Sound. You know, I was always very proud to go back there. I'm still out, you know? I like happened when I was studying abroad when I was like yeah I was 21 I studied in Barcelona and I traveled and I stayed at a hostel in London like right by Ministry of Sound I didn't really know that much about dance music other than kind of like some of the radio stuff that was bubbling up and I went and I like was in the like trance room or something and I was like I'd never <laughs> heard trance before and I was just like my friend didn't get it but I was like this is like it was just like such an indescribable feeling, like you discovered something that's obviously existed, but you yeah, had no you idea. Hear something like that on a system like that, and they actually had, and this is what I was really impressed with. The first time I, I didn't know what to expect. The first time I came over to, to London or the UK, and to my surprise, it was a Richard Long sound system, same as we use in New York. So I immediately it was like, oh, it's like home. It was honestly they modeled it after, from what I understand. Uh, the Paradise Garage. It was just on, on a mirror image of it. And they actually had Larry Levan come in and tune the system. Oh, so wow. it was spoiled to death. So the minute I walked in, I was already like home. <laughs> and, I, and ever since then, it's been like, you know, second home to me. And these guys, you know, they always treated all those of us uh, New York DJs to like, you know, the king. That's the best way I could say it. You know, and, you know, I, I, I learned a lot 
you know, just growing up in, in a lot of the clubs, just abroad in Italy and all these places, and you know, home in New York. Yeah, it, it is crazy how like. Yeah, how like sound, like literally like be the sound system, a song, whatever, like can like take you, like can really like transport you. Oh, yeah. Like that, that's what I really love about it. It it certain songs sound so different in the club when they're amplified. Mm. They really do. And that this is why I wanted to do my album in the clubs, because I wanted to get the tonality of each club. And that's why I did it, because it's like I was so fascinated of, of how something can sound so different at home and when you play it out the tones change and they get amplified in this huge space and it, it adds a depth to the song that you didn't know you know would be there it always surprised me that way but since i was a you know, teenager do you have a song from like when you kind of first fell in love with house music that still kind oh, of brings you back there's a few i, I there was a place called Twin City when we were like, again, teenagers, young teenagers, that we would go skate at. And we roller skate around, it was like a disco roller skating place. <clears throat> and it was a, one of these infamous places, but you know, the DJs there, they were always playing you know, broken and new stuff. I can't remember what the person was. <clears throat> but I remember hearing, one of the cuts was like, rock skate, roll bounce. Like Vaughn Mason, and it was just, you know, all like, you know, it was cool. In good times and cheap and all that stuff. But the one song that stood out to me, and I never heard it before, was a song called Is It In by Jimmy Bohorn. And it was just, you know, cute songs in the beginning. Is it in? Yes, it's in. And I just remember that thing broke down. It just said, Is It In? Is It In? And it just broke down to this bass line by itself with some kind of like snare drum. And I remember as a, like a, a teenager going, Oh my God. What is that? It's just doom, 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 and the DJ just kept making the break long. And I was like, this is, we're, we're losing our minds hearing this song. No one's heard it. It's the first time I've ever heard it. A lot of us never heard it. And we're just like skating around with this bass line like this. Yeah, just like losing it. And, you know, again, I, I was just like so happy. This is the first time I heard a song that I just went, that's incredible. That's absolutely, I got to figure out what that was. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know the DJ. I didn't know any of this stuff. And then um, later on, my dad just so you know, my dad's a DJ. So uh, maybe a couple weeks later, we're at Rally Racket Club, and there was this other guy named uh, I think it was Disco Brown or DJ Brown or something like that. And he was using a reel to reel, same same as this is why I love reel to reels and all these machines and things. Because I grew up, you know, testing things out on them, and they would test things out and play stuff. So my dad actually had that song I heard. I was like, whoa, you have that song, what is it? And I saw it and I just immediately like stole his record because he had a couple copies. And I just could not stop playing that song. And this guy came in to play the club on Real or Real. There's a song called, um, let me get this right. Uh, it sounded like he did it on a Casio, like a real, like a, like a Casio machine it was at. Uh, Find A Way by Russ Brown. And I'm not sure if Russ Brown was actually a DJ or whatever it was, but I heard that song and I was like, oh my God, what? You could do that with a, you know, like something that sounded like it was on a Casio? It was a rough draft, didn't have any vocals, it was just this instrumental with that song on it. And I think it was like early 80s, like mid, mid 80s, I'm going to say. And I heard it. And I was like, this is wild. I said, you know, this is like kind of. It was like someone playing, like, you know, and it, that's my first introduction of what I. What I consider house with some kind of strange electronic music that somebody did on their Casio using the drums from it. And I was like, this is, this is kind of bumping. You know, it's like, I like this, you know, and, and never since then. And then when I found out it came out later, I was like, oh, wow, they put a vocal to this thing. And it was playing on the radio. And I was like, yeah, okay. So you can make stuff up like that and have it come out. And then, um, you know, my dad was friends with like Surface and Cool in the Gang and all these people. So I got to hear a lot of, you know, Ladies Night and all these things that Surface did. And so that was for me like my first introduction of like disco turning into some kind of house. And that and that's when I was hooked. And I, I gotta say, was maybe 13, 14, I started playing with my dad at the clubs and learning all these songs and watching how all that happened and hearing all these new Chicago style records and 
you know, and all these imports coming in from, from like just Europe, and Germany, and they learn about craft work and all these wild things. So it just fascinated me. They're just there for hours looking at craft work album covers. Like, what is that stuff they're using? Especially the, the Computer World album. It's just fascinating. I want to sit there and looking at like the covers and all the writing and you know that's the one thing i loved about albums back then you can just look at an album and learn so much that's so cool yeah and then i then you know some people that i you know every time i saw like it's what was this thing um every time i would see this one it made me laugh a tom Moulton mix so i was like i've never seen anybody write it that way a tom Moulton mix but i kept <laughs> Seeing his name, and every time I heard of Tom Moulton, mix, I'm like, this man is incredible. I don't know who this Tom Moulton person is. I've never met him before. I'm like, this man is incredible. And then uh, all these years, I, I've never met this man. And then somebody asked me to remix Dr. Love. And there were some parts missing. I'm like, where are the horns? Where are the other stuff? Where is this stuff at? So I, I actually got in touch with Tom Moulton. Like, you know, when I had the remix, it, they said, yeah, call Tom. And Tom, maybe he'll, he'll have it. He'll know what's going on with it. So I called him up. And he he became, like, my best friend that day. And it was the coolest thing to have one of my heroes, like, to speak to one of my heroes. Not just asking them questions. I, I must have talked to him that first day for three hours straight. And I was, like, so, like, wow. I learned so much how arrangements work. How he did certain songs at Philly National, how he set up the microphones, how he set up the orchestras. And he told me a really wild song. I mean, the thing would happen with the, the horns. He was telling me that Chef Pettibone actually erased the horns off the multi track, probably, you know, like putting a clap track on or something. He was really angry about it. <laughs> and then, um, what was it? There was some really funny other thing he told me. Oh, when he finished Dr. Love, he wouldn't leave the studio. He was doing a lock in pretty much. He actually had a heart attack. Or something like some heart condition, you had to go to the hospital while he finished the mix for Dr. Love. Mm. And I was like, You're kidding. And he said, No, I'm serious. They were bringing him around the wheel, like not wheelchair, um, the stretcher to go to the hospital because he wanted to finish the mix. So, you know, it was, it was, it was a bunch of interesting stories and, and, and anecdotes he shared with me. And I'm really, like, really grateful because I learned so much that day. A lot, like you know, our string arrangements work and everything else. And, like all of his tricks, and he just pretty much, you know, just went off and just showed me and, and talked to me about, you know, real, like really real how to do production and how he did it and how he, he approached it. And I was really grateful and respectful for, for even having that conversation with one of my heroes. Mm. So that that's my introduction pretty much to house music. Is that something that you think about, like, now you know being in the position you're in like do you think about mentorship or like sharing your knowledge i mean just oh, talking to you now you're like so open with everything but yeah how do you think about yeah. it no i i think um again it's like i love the future of, of where the music can go and I, if anyone everyone that knows me it's like anyone that's even on my label i make sure to get a point of knowing them personally mm. anytime i do a remix or something same thing um, there, there hasn't been one person I, I've met or haven't, you know, have remixed anything on my label that we're not close friends. Mm. You know, if they need anything from me, they know they can just call me in two minutes. And, you know, I keep in touch with everybody. Okay, where where was I? I'm like da dancing or dancing around my uh, my questions over here. Um... Oh yeah, okay, and I yeah I did want to talk about the the Lost and Found EP as well. I'm assuming that they're unreleased tracks that you picked. Absolutely, yeah. What, what happens is, I mean, it all started. Um, a couple of friends of mine had some tracks of mine, and they asked me what I was doing with them. I was like, How did you even get that? It started from um, one track uh, that my friend Will had with my grandfather on it. Wow. I did some songs with my grandfather. My grandfather was an old jazz singer. And there was this one particular track. I I never finished it. I didn't even have the masters anymore for nothing. And Wilson just says, you know, you remember this? And I said, remember what? what is he sends it over to me. I'm playing. I'm like, where did you find this? How did you even get your hands on this? And he says, don't worry about that part. He says, just, I'm laughing. He's got songs of mine that I don't even have. 
And I said, dude, can I have this? You know, have this back? I want to put this out. And on the first one, I actually put his name down there. And uh, my other friend, Cherise, uh, she had some demos and stuff I did way, way back. I've never finished them. But she had, you know, some of these rough drafts because I always, like, had friends and take a listen to this, tell me what you think. And I'm like, well, if you did this, this, and that. And, you know, then I get on the road and forget about even, like, if I even did the track. So a lot of this stuff was that. Mm -hmm. The things I found in my old archive, going back through like old dad tapes and things. And it's just like, oh, wow. You know, and they were pretty cool, but I've never finished them all. You know, some of them were like demos for people that I, that they were supposed to put a vocal through that just never did. And, you know, stuff like that. And I, I was just like, wow, these tracks are pretty cool for now. You know, but they're like 20 years old, some of these things. 30 years old. You know? Like the one with my grandfather, that's about 30, 30 years old. Wow. Which one is that with him? Uh, let me see, because we did a couple. There was some... Um, what did I end up calling it? Let me see, let me find out. Because I will, will, I'll have Will actually name it. What will we do? That's it. What shall we do? That's what it was called. Yeah. And so all of them were demos and then you finished them, like... I didn't even finish them. I just put them out as a were. <laughs> As I said, it's, it's fun. Let's find out what these things do because they sounded raw enough and, and just cool. Like these were like just good, like oh, I gotta finish this one day, but never finished them. And I just said, you know what? Let me just put them up just like this, just to see what happens. You know, so people can actually hear the process of what I kind of do. And they just honestly, I don't know why I never did it that way, but they, some of them just sound finished. And it's just, you know, like I said, sometimes if I want to add things, maybe I already finished it. I don't know. Okay, I would not have guessed that they were demos. <laughs> All demos, yeah. That's really cool. Things I've, never fin things I've never finished, and that's why they were kind of just lost. If there were real versions, I don't know I actually had them not. I, I don't usually have um, songs that I just sit around and wait on. If they're, if they're sitting around, I just I don't finish them. And this is what kind of happens. I get an idea in my head, and just, no, I'll work on it later. And then I forget I, I've done it, I just, you know. Not gone back to it. Hmm. Yeah, and I was um, like a little bit, but like delightfully um, surprised by Fluff Rehab's like driving techno. Like, I, I think I was like listening, like just like listening to songs on Spotify when I was running, and I was like, this is a Gary Chandler track? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what's up with that one? <laughs> Which one is it you were talking about? The, um, I think it's the first one on it. Um, it's called Fluff Rehab. Oh, that was a funny story. I, was, I did that about, I want to say 12 years ago. And it was Dennis and, and I, Martinez Brothers. And it's kind of one of those things they were telling me, like, I should go and make some of these tougher things, like one of these things. And they said, you know, and I was always joking about it a lot of time when I did Back to the Raw. I was like, that's enough of this fluffy, like, weak, let's get back to the Raw. So it was just a, a discussion that we had. And uh, originally, uh, I think Dennis was supposed to have it on objectivity. So we were messing around with it. And I just it just never went anywhere. I just never did anything else with it. I just kind of let it sit. And I let it out i kind of i did this thing where i gave away a lot of my tracks one day on my facebook page it was like 84 tracks of just demos of things i've finished or things that weren't out digital and i just put them all up and i had so much fun with it and that was one of the tracks that everybody kept asking me i was standing out like, can you do this no can you gonna put it out you're gonna put it out you're gonna put it out i just never did i just gave it away and then i just said you know what maybe i need to have it on vinyl and i'll just put it out that way and that's what happened that's so cool. I, I, I love that yeah, story. Same thing. It was in a demo stage. I never finished it. And, you know, next thing I know, it just, it just did really well. Why did you put out uh, tracks on Facebook? Like, just for people to hear, like, different things? Just to kind of say thank you. Hmm. Just to say, like, you know what? It's like, I've been doing what I love for so many years. And I, and I can't remember. I think it was my birthday or something. And I said, I said something like that. I, I, I always, you know, give presents on my birthday. Uh, I think I want to give this one out for everybody who's been supporting me for all of these years. And um, I just put it up. I thought it'd be fun to do. No one does that kind of thing. 
and I, and I really appreciate everyone playing my music. So I just said, you know what? Things that are out on digital, they, you can only get it as vinyl. A lot of people don't have turntables, no DJs, that, you know. So I just said, you know what? Here you go. I'll put it on WeTransfer and just let it all out. And I left it up. I said I was going to leave it up for like 48 hours. I extended it. WeTransfer actually called me up, was asking me what's going on. Like, why is this happening? It was like 200,000 downloads. <laughs> and I'm laughing at myself. I'm thinking, wow, if people actually paid 200, you know, for 200,000 downloads, that would be incredible. But it's there. It was for free. And, you know, it's just infamous for doing that. And at some point, I'm actually going to end up doing it again, probably very soon. That's so cool. And I don't know, yeah, we're in like such a weird age now too with like, well, of the digital age where like, yeah, you can kind of listen to anything on streaming. Oh, yeah. You can find anything you want streaming somewhere or YouTube or, or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, but um, maybe there was a question there, but I don't know. I'm not going to try to <laughs> pick one out of my ass. No, no worries. <laughs> um, Okay, we talked about spaces and places. Okay, 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 we're moving along. Um, yeah, and I wanted to ask you about um, remixes too. Like obviously you've done like so many like memorable ones over the years. Um, Thank you. Uh, you're in my system is like, just oh. one of those, <laughs> I can like listen to forever. It, it is in my system forever. Yeah. Um, yeah, but how do you typically approach a remix okay um again that that one was an interesting what happened was i did this track called track one on atmosphere and that was on shelter records years and years ago and jerome um jerome sidna one of my best friends he used to work at um atlantic records and uh that song system was actually on atlantic and he got the rights for it to license it. And he says, what can we do with this? And he had the idea of like, you know what, let's take track one, mess around with it a little bit, modify it so it actually fits, you know, system. And let's just turn that into, you know, a club record, like properly, but use track one to do it. I said, okay, we could do that. You know, so we messed around, used the same kind of everything that was in track one. And I just changed the, the programming for the, the way the synth went. And um, Dennis came in, and there's a, there's a sound in there, because Dennis was always doing techno. And it would go, wah, 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 some kind of filtery thing. And I was like, that is the weirdest thing I, I, I could ever hear from like anyone doing anything. So I said, we'll keep it in there. And then, but I did the same thing, arranged it all where it made sense. And I took some strings and just put them in and layered it. And then we just played it back and said, you know what, this works. Let's just go. Let's just do this, and it just it became what it became. It's this monster, the song that just did well forever. You know, it's like I can't go to a club and not play that song now. Otherwise, you know, people would be mad at me. <laughs> they would really be angry. It's almost like going to see your favorite band and they don't play the song that you wanted them to play. You know? And I've always seen that. The first time I get to a club, everyone's with their phones up and it's going system or rain or something. It's like there's certain songs that I. There's no way I can go to a club and not play it. The bar at home or something. It's just something. Something would happen. Something would. Have, something probably would happen to me if I didn't play that song. <laughs> Do you ever get like annoyed about those tracks that you like have to play or like? No, it's a, you know it's part of me. It's like you know, watching it grow up and it's just another generation. And I always mm -hmm. add my spin on it on a new like a new way. I always like there's the keyboard there, so I end up playing something over it or expanding it a bit. My friend Troy actually and, and um, Troy and Dennis Dennis uh, Quinn, he actually redid it with my friend Troy, so it, it got another iteration of it, and we put it out again, and it just had a it had a blast with it, and it's like you know now people can actually see it being sung. You know, and then I did a holographic version of it, where I actually had Troy doing a, you know, a, you know, a performance of it, you know, and that's actually on YouTube at one of the the reel to reel shows. I think you can actually see it. 
And it was, it was a lot of fun. You know, I, I still have a lot of fun with it. And mm. I'm very grateful that people still enjoy the song. So no, I'm never mad at my, my old catalog. I'm actually very proud of it. <laughs> um, yeah, and speaking of uh, classics, um, you know, I want to... Um, I wanted to ask about uh, Rain. Uh-huh. I love that one. Um, yeah, how did that one come together? And like, how did you feel when you finished? Oh man, I think that's why we sing Rain out more than any any song I've ever done. Um, Rain was about my ex girlfriend, mm. and her her new actual name was like Sky. That's what that's what we call her as a nickname, Sky. And I could never no matter how much I tried to work with, with this girl to make her realize that I cared about her, she just would not, just, it just would not work. It was just, she was just so paranoid every time I left the house, like something crazy was going to happen. And it doesn't matter how much I love her, she was just always angry and just out there. You know, it's just like, all I want to do is love you. Right? Why are you making it this way? You know, Rain, you know, make, you're making things terrible. You're making my sunny skies gray. You know, all I wanted you to do is calm down and stay. You know, you know how you know, and she'd tell me sorry and all these things. I'm like, well, how are you going to make it all right? You know, it's like, you know, why are you making it this way? Mm-hmm. You know, that, and that, that was really it. It's just me, kind of just you know trying to to say to her in a song like, wait, it shouldn't have to be this way. Yeah, that's, a, that's another line in the song. It doesn't have to be this way. You know, you, you know you're making me feel so lonely. You know, why do you have to be this way? And it's just me actually just writing a note, but it's a song. Mm. That's what happened. And it was just, it was really after this, just a bad breakup from the, after all of this stuff. You know, we cared about each other, but it's nothing I could do. What, what did she say about the song, though? She knows it's about her because she writes it all the time. You know, she doesn't, she didn't want to break up either, but it's just, you know, I, I had to get away because it was no good for me. And it was like, I wanted her to be happy and move on with her life. And, and she did in the end, I think. She's got a, you know, she's got married, I think, and she has a, a child. So I, I'm hoping she's happy. You know, we were very close, but at the same time, we got fire and ice. Did, like... What, like, how did it make you feel when you, like, first, like, heard the track when you were done with it? Because there's so much emotion in that. Yeah, I, you know, the funny thing is, the, I think in the chord progression and the tone, there's something about that, that synth that made me go, like, wow, this is such a pretty synth, and the, the harmonics on it. I was, sit, I was sitting there in one of my moods, and I had, like, a glass of whiskey, and was sitting there, and I was listening to Thelanius Monk. And it was a song called Round Midnight. And that's where I kind of got my idea from. I just did a faster version of one of the, the chord progressions with the Linus Monk in my own way. And um, if you ever hear a song called Round Midnight, you can kind of hear um, rain in there. I almost started to take the Linus Monk, take an acapella and just sing rain over Round Midnight. That's so cool. It's Did it really- feel really moody song too it's just like da, 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 and i love jazz so for me it was like really moody it fit my mood and i was just like you know what let me get this off of my chest while i'm still thinking about it and that's what that was and i just sat and played and i was playing piano for a minute and i said but you know what let me let me do this I mean that whole that whole EP. It's called the Moody EP because I was really moody that day, and all of the songs on it, it's, it's all have like this jazz overtone to all of it. Is making music usually a cathartic process for you? Mm. Like, like I said, I have to sit and feel things out, and it, you can tell every single song I've ever made has a reason. I, I, like I said, I, I have to sit. And, and live with something, mm. and then it becomes a song. I, I can't write it. I can't just go, I'm going to make a track today, and it's going to be about this, this. I, I can't do it. Even if it's like a, an instrumental, I just can't just go and 
something had something had to influence me. Something had to make me think about what I'm doing. Otherwise, it felt forced, and I don't finish it. I just no. Okay, this started. I'll, I'll walk away from it and not think about it anymore. It'll start as like a, a thought. Sometimes I wake up from a dream with the best things in my head. Like, oh my god, I gotta put this down. This came from my dream, you know. And I do that. Yeah. That's so cool. Uh, deep, deep house. <laughs> yeah. No, it has to be. I have to. I have to feel like it can relate to someone before I can make it, or I have to get something off of my my chest. No, it's, um, it's therapeutic to me, honestly. Hmm. Yeah, it's like a part of the. Sounds like it's a part of the like processing of of mm. emotions and experiences. Yeah, it, it's really it's really a part of my life. It really, really is. Like all of it. I mean, I, I've made songs. Like there was a song I made for my daughter, and I was on the road so much, and she was about three years old, and I always hated leaving my children. And I mean, what happened was, even when she was born, I had to get on an airplane and fly right to mm. Switzerland. I literally saw her being born cut the cord, got on the airplane, and I really didn't like the idea of that. So what I did was for the rest of the year, I kind of took off and just made music. And I stayed home because I didn't want to miss anything. And I just, mm. that's all I did. So for the first year of my daughter's birth, I was just with her at home. Didn't want to miss anything. No words missing, no no footsteps. No, you know, I wanted to see everything. I did the same thing with my son, but when she was about three years old, she could really um, speak with me you know, about her curiosities and things. I shared um, I shared the kind of day we had on a record called my, you know, for my daughter. So it's like, you know, it's like uh, watching food. We, we, we watching Scooby-Doo, you know, what's this stuff? Get, this stuff is getting all over you. Let's go to the park. Let's go fly a kite. Get your bike. Let's go. You know, it's just like all of these things that we do. It's just I shared the, the day that we would normally have and how much I loved her in case anything ever happened to her. So I wanted to leave behind some sort of message or note because things were going so well for me. You know, it's like, if something goes wrong, I want to make sure that she has a music, musical note that, or, or a letter that I wrote to her. Mm. You know, but, but this has always been my life. It's always been this way. Like another song I've done, like Who's Afraid of the Dark? That was one of my other favorites. And it was about even though it's an instrumental, um, I just moved into a new house, had a huge basement where I was going to put the studio, and I just put like you know some stuff in there, but some of the basement wasn't done yet, and there were like some pipes and things laying around, and some things downstairs, and they would play hot. This house is this house is huge. They would play, you know, hide and seek, especially in the basement because there were so many rooms down there, and they just turn off the lights, and my daughter would lose her mind because my son loved loved the dark. And he was like chasing around, and it's like he had this pipe, and he's banging on this pipe, going king, 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 king. And I was like, okay, you know, it's, it's, and I'm running downstairs. I'm like, what's going on down here? We're playing hide and seek. And Carrie's yelling. My daughter's name is Carrie. I named her after me. So I'm like, what's going on down here? Well, the Max keeps turning off the light. I said, what? You're afraid of the dark? I said, you know, he says, and Max is like, I'm not afraid of the dark. I said, well, I'm not either. I said, who's afraid of the dark? And that's where the song came from. And there's a sound in there in the song initially. It just starts up, ding, dong, sounds like someone's banging on pipes. I actually recorded my son banging on the pipes in the basement. And I, I put them in the track. And that's how that one came to be. Oh, my God. That's so funny. Yeah, but that's, that's my process. <laughs> yeah, I was going to um, ask, like, Obviously, you've been DJing and producing since you were a teenager. It's been it's been a hot minute now. Like, how do you like? What keeps you excited? Like, I mean, you describing it kind of explains it. But yeah, yeah. What 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 keeps you excited and coming back? Being on the road and, and seeing other people and, and just life experiences. That's what keeps me excited. Mm. And I just kind of express what I feel like. And there's certain tones and things I hear in clubs. I'm like, I want to go home and try that. But at the same time, I'm living something on the road or at home or there's something I experience. And then there's the, there's a certain sound I might hear in a new scent that I picked up or a plug in. I'm like, oh, I love this sound. This is, this is matching the mood I have today. Mm. And I would just go for it. 
sounds fun. I'm like, I want, I want this life. <laughs> it's, it's just a spontaneous, uh, spontaneous, beautiful way of, of being, I, I believe, mm-hmm. in your production. And I say the same thing, even if I'm remixing someone, I, I, I want to get to know why they wrote the song. All right, here's another one for you. Really, really cool. Um, one of my favorite songs I've actually done. Arnold Jarvis, I did this song called Inspiration. First day I've met Arnold. Uh, like properly. I've seen him do shows before. But first day he came to my studio and I actually met him. He came with another friend, Sengi Yeo. And um, he was just telling me they came from a hospital where one of his friends was dying in the hospital. But he was so full of life and he was really, you know, inspirational. And he was saying all of this stuff to me. And I was just like, and he says, you know, this, you know, and it really affected him, but in a good way, because he was just like, you know, he's like, I've never seen anybody so full of life. And, you know, they're on the, pretty much on a deathbed. Mm. And he said, that was just like, you know, mind blowing to him. And he says, you know, you know, would you like to create some kind of song or something? And the way my song was set, my, my song, my studio was set up, um, it was set up exactly because I fell in love with Ministry of Sound back then. It was back in 91, 92, or 93. So I built my studio to look just like Ministry of Sound. And I put all my gear in the middle of the room. This is why I was so inspired to make spaces and places. So as I'm, you know, I had a piano in, in the studio, like a grand piano. And I'm sitting there, he, he's just singing stuff, and I'm playing, just playing piano and He's got the mic in the middle of the room. We got the, got the room amped up, loud, and just got some beats going. I'm just playing keyboards. And he, he looked at me and says, can we do it this way for real, like live? Mm. I said, yeah, I can play it live. We can sing it. We can try it this way. I never did that before, but I think it would be kind of fun. We could do that. He wrote three words in his hand. One was, I think, inspiration, celebration of life, um, and some other word. I can't remember what it was. So I, I, I was using tape back then. I rewound it back. And I just hit record. And I did like a rough draft of the music, like the, the basis of it. It just started playing. He started singing. That song was done in one take. Wow. He just, all of it was off the top of his head. That's all of me just playing piano one time through. That song took 20 minutes. That's, that's how inspiration was made. Then we listened back to it and I said, oh my God, this is, this is really nice. I love this. This is beautiful. This is like our first time making a song together. And I said, you know, and I said, you know, I don't even want to do this song. This is great. And we went back and, and I played some things back and I was like, what should the song be called? And I'm looking back to the lines and I saw where he kept saying inspiration. Inspiration to me, life has just begun. So I just sampled it, that one part, and I just flew it in wherever I thought it would fit. And that's how inspiration was made one time take and I just took pieces of his vocal and just put it and panned him and that was it and we just kind of looked at it and was like yeah that goes on the album Damn. and then me and Arnold have been like you know close friends ever since and if you if you were to see Arnold on his on his uh, arm he actually has a tattoo of a microphone and underneath it it actually says inspiration on that <laughs> Damn. Damn, yeah. I'm like sure you have like I would like want to hear every story about every song. Yeah, but this is what if you ask me about any song, there's a story behind every single one, including my first. And I think that's why I did all of this stuff, from good or bad. It's just it's why I've done every single song that way because I, I, I was used to doing like hip hop music and I was doing all that stuff before. And my very first song I've done was called "Get It Off." I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Um. I had a girlfriend named Tracy. I loved Tracy. Tracy was my heart. I wanted to marry this woman. We were were trying to actually have kids. I was like 17, 18 years old. We just knew we were going to be together, period. Her birthday um, was September 1st. And our anniversary was funny enough. It was uh, strange day enough. It was September 11th. And my birthday is September 28th. Um, What we planned to get married. I really love this woman. It's like a guy, I just want to know life to be with her, about her. She may be the happiest person I've ever met. Really, I mean, she's so bold. It just like brought the best out of me. And uh, same thing with her. She has so much potential for everything. Just like this, probably the boldest woman I've ever known, but she was so protective. And so um, 
inspiring, giving, caring, everything you could imagine. Like one of my, just my best friend. And um, what happened was on her birthday, I was going to go, I was playing Club America. She was going to Zanzibar. And there was this guy named Peter who actually um, wanted to be with her. Because right? he didn't like the idea of us being with him. Um, I was going to meet her after I finished Zanzibar, because it's around, not Zanzibar, um, Club America, which is around the corner, the same guy owned all three clubs. And we are just going to meet up there and just go home from there. And somehow, he chased her out of the club or something, I guess he was harassing her. My, my one of my best friends, Doc, was the bouncer of a Zanzibar. He told me he saw her leave with this guy or something. And she looked really, you know, concerned. And I was like, okay, well, that's really odd, because I went there looking for her. Nothing, nothing happened, and I didn't know what was going on. I didn't see her for the whole night. I thought it was odd, so I'm kind of like, oh, this is real weird. You know, so I'm calling around everywhere trying to figure out where she is. This is before cell phones and everything else. And I'm like, okay, this is really, really crazy. It's around 1988, and I had to do a party the next day. So I'm setting up for a party. Haven't heard from her all day, and I'm like, we're supposed to be going out and hanging out, and it's her birthday. Didn't get a chance to see her, yeah. and um, you know, and I, I saw her earlier that day. And the last thing she told me is, "I love you," and gave me a wink. Um, so what I found out later was the guy who was trying to, you know, harass her or whatever, you know, was really trying to be with her. He was really upset about the whole thing, so he. At Zanzibar, he took her behind the building, raped her, uh, smashed her head open with a, a rock, like a cinder block or a brick or something, and shoved a stick up inside of her and put her behind the bushes. And it destroyed me. It really it hurt my, my everything. I didn't know what to think about this. Because I wasn't used to... I've never had some, lost someone so close to me, and, and especially at such a violent day. And... She loved house music. I mean, a lot. Like, she really, you know, introduced me to a lot of things I've never heard, all the Chicago stuff and all these other things. And she said it was the same like I'm saying now. It's very therapeutic. So I um, I decided I'm going to, you know, try to do some house just, just to see how it feels. And a friend of mine told me, like, oh, well, I think you'd be really good at doing house music. But I never really thought about it. I was doing edits and things and never really producing and stuff. So I said, okay, well, let me just try to make a record. So I took everything I knew about the song. Let me turn this down. It sounds like the echo is coming back. I said, let me do everything I know about um, about what she said and how to, to make house music. So what I did was um, I used a method that I heard Quincy Jones uh, say, which was you take a sound, and what is that sound sing saying? Like a song like... Um, I think it was Miles Davis, So What? It's like, the song was like, even with the horns, it's like the bass line would do something and the horns would answer. So it would go, like if you were singing it, I like a cup of coffee. So what? It's, it's another time of day. So what? It's, you know, I, I think I'm going to smoke and go, go smoking. So what? And then I'm going to have a drink. So what? You know, that if you had to imagine words, that's what it'd be like with Spain. Like, you know, like Al Jarreau did with Spain. And I was just like, oh, okay, da, 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 da. you know, what were the words saying and what fashion were they saying in them? So I, I used the same method. I said, okay, how do I feel? I feel very melancholy. So I, I put a string line down with that sound, like a really, really uh, thick, uh, rounded off uh, melancholy tone for the, for the synth. And then I started adding things to it that I thought would, would encompass what I felt like. First thing I thought was I, her, I'm so angry at her, the person that killed her, and I'm I'm calling him out just on the song. There's a part in there that says, "You are so vicious." Mm. Just, you are so vicious. You know, that's that's where it started, and then how it felt to me, like to lose her so abruptly. I put this part in the song where it sounds like the the needle got ripped off of a record because my life changed so abruptly because of that. So you hear it in the middle of the song where the groove is going, it just goes, Rah! and it just goes, now is the time, now is the time. I'm just thinking to myself, i got to stop feeling like this. 
Mm. And I have to get it off of my mind. I have to get it off of my head. So myself, I'm repeating myself in my head, going, get it off, get it off, set it loose, set it loose. You know, get it off, get it off your mind. And I didn't want to say get it off my mind because it's just been too much. So I said, get it off, get it off, set it loose, set it loose. I'd set it free and, and let me go into what I need to do. And, and that's how the song came to be. And that's, that was my first song. And it's so weird how right after that, everything that she wanted from me that I wanted to do for us happened. And I got signed to Atlantic Records because of it. Mm. And that, that was the start of my career. And I just never let go. And I said, you know what? This is the best, best method for me to work. Just express how I feel. And funny enough, the, um, when the label, when I did the yellow copies, there's these test pressings of it that I had um, released on the album, on the, on the EP. I mean, there's Drink On Me, there's Super Lover, and there's Get It Off, and all these things all in this one album, and they all got split up and sent to major labels. And I think, I mean, even on there, if you look at the, their Atlantic copy, there's a little thing on there, and even on, it's called Express Records. Because I was expressing how I feel. And on Atlantic, if you look at the copy, it actually says it there. Express. Expressing. And that was it. And that, that's what started my house career. Wow. Um, what does house mean to you? It's my entire life. It's my being. It's my love. It's my, my outlet. It's my therapy. It's my... Yeah, it's, it's, it's my thought process. You know, I wake up and feel blessed every day that I get to do something I love. I get to be in a different country um, almost probably every other day. You know, and I, I, just, and I just feel blessed to do something I love, and I have such a wonderful fan base. And they support you know, so much, and there are a lot of people coming into it learning a lot of this stuff, and I, I try to you know, help as much as I can with the next generation coming. I'm always staying curious. I've never have a I never had a favorite time period either. I'm always mm. looking for the next time period. Like I, I never stay stuck. Like oh, I love the '90s. And it's, but I've always wanted to advance and figure out things and try to expand and just staying curious about everything I do. I mean, try to be the better person I can be, a better producer, better everything. Damn, that's an answer. <laughs> 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 um. Yeah, and what are your thoughts on like the state of house music uh, currently? I think as long as there are people that want to dance, there's going to be house music. What iteration of it, I'm not really sure. Um, I think coming, there's going to be a lot of um, writing issues that AI is going to start taking over things. I think mm. things are, it's going to go beyond just sampling and copyright things and what's going to be it's the wild, wild west of AI right now. And I think this, all of this stuff is going to be encompassed in music making somehow, good or bad. I'm not sure where it's all going to go, but when you have number one hits with people that uh, never work together, or these things are like a phantom version of music, I think that's what's going to end up happening. Because I mean, it's like you, you have these dream teams of people. like one of, There's number one hits of like Drake and I think it was... A weekend or something like that. I can't remember the name of the song. And, you know, they had to rush in just like they did everything else with, like, Napster and stop these things. You know? It's going to be the same thing. It's going to be the same kind of Wild Wild West thing happening. You know, because people are going to figure out how to use it. Just like, you know, I remember growing up and, you know, learning computers and programming and all this other stuff. They, they, the way they used to... Oh, Say like computers will work. I remember seeing this and laughing to myself. Like they have no idea where this is going to go. They were using computers for recipes in the kitchen. Like you can use it for recipes. I'm like, it's a computer. Are you going to just bring it to the kitchen and use it for recipes? I'm like, you have no idea what you could do with this machine. It's like that was that was you know that's how they're going to sell it. It seems so it seems so funny to me. And I'm, I remember going. And building like computers with my friend Steven and we're going on to bulletin board systems and just like we, we watched I think it was what was the movie God, I used to love this movie uh, something like 
you want to play a game. I'm trying to remember the name of this movie. Uh, War Games. The War Games, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> And we were like, you know, we were trying to be like those kids, you know, that guy, and like, oh my God, Matthew Broderick going, oh yeah, we got a computer, let's try to, you know, go into places, and, you know, and I got really lucky early on that we found all of these numbers, there's a thing called tra a Transtronic Hacker, or Hacker 2600, and we found all these underground things to go and check out, and, you know, put the modem down onto the phone line, and, you know, parents would get angry because it would cost this much per minute, but we'd be on all night downloading weird games and stuff and you know programming and basic and COBOL and hexadecimal and, you know but we, we loved it and this is our sort of beginning of it and, you know running tape drives and then I found like you know you can actually do music with these things and sequencing and that's when things began to really take shape I mean, back in the early 80s. That's wild. It's it like so nerdy, but I'm sure it's... Oh, like, God, yeah, it was complete. Like, if, if I wasn't a DJ, they'd probably beat me to death in, like, the streets. <laughs> so it's like, I was, at least I had to did some cool stuff because I was doing hip-hop and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, like, I'm the one with the studio. Let's go in and rap. All my friends are rappers or break, break dancers or some kind of, like, spray paint artist or something like that. So I was always, you know, the one that could get things moving. You know, it's just the one with the DJ system and all this stuff and... So, but if I was just doing what I was doing, like nerdy stuff, you know, I'd, I'd probably have, you know, glasses, little thing, you know, pencil thing, and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and what, uh, what, like, gear, because obviously, like, gear and music technology has been such a big part of your career, mm -hmm. like, what, yeah, gear and music tech have you been working with lately, or, like, you've been getting excited? Ooh. I, I I joke about it a lot. I say I have one of everything, and I really do. I've been collecting gears so much, and I have the stuff I use, and then there's the storage of things that I have. I'm not, I'm not joking. I mean, between Dennis and I, Dennis Ferrer, he collects a lot of gear, and he then he recommends gear. And when I met Dennis, he actually worked at this place called World Music, and I was in there religiously picking up things. And if I didn't like the way it sounded, I, you know, I modified my machines to do things that they're not supposed to do. You know, and same thing with plugins. I, I programmed a lot of plugins early on for myself and to make them sound a certain way or do certain things. You know, and Dennis comes from the same background. When I met Dennis, also when he came to the studio, he, he was a programmer. He was programming C++, so we got along very, very well. You know, the things that he couldn't do without programming, I would do with the hardware. So, you know, we were just like freaking frack, a perfect couple for making weird machines. You know, I still do. I make like laser synths and crazy things and, you know, things that aren't supposed to work together. I make them communicate. You know, a lot of my inspiration came from this, this big synth called Tonto that I got to go visit and I lost my mind. I was just like, what? you know, and then I went to see it and I didn't know what it was. And it's in Canada at this place called Bell Museum that, that has all these, it's a museum of just out there synths and things that, that don't exist. So when I went to see it, I kind of just looked at it like, oh my God, I'm in front of Tonto, this is incredible. And, you know, I get to play with it. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I actually have all of these modules at home. I have all the same synths in this machine here. I can actually just go home and like make a rack of Tonto. So when I moved to my, my newer house, that's exactly what I did. I made my own version of Tonto and wrapped myself around the room. <laughs> That's wild. Um, and yeah, you've been uh, obviously using real to real for a long time, but like bringing it back, you know, now like you've done some of your boiler rooms and stuff with it, which are super cool. Like what, oh, yeah, what, like, why do you like return to real to real? Because I know it's obviously probably quite like difficult to actually DJ. Oh, with. it's a, it's I, it's like punishment. I must love like torture. It's um. Let me, let me just try to back this up. I was always, I always loved tape. I love the saturation and so on the tape. Mm. When I put something on tape, it sounds completely different than what it sounds like being recorded on like digital. And uh, I started working with this company just recently called Recording the Masters, where they um, I'm actually supposed to do an interview next month and go to the tape factory with these guys 
and um, they're going to have me actually build a new kind of tape machine. So that's another one of those things I'm going to end up tape tinkering with. But it's such a lost art, and we used it all. All of us DJs knew how to use it. You know, in New York, it was that's how we would test the songs or do edits and things like that. We'd all have tape machines, and we'd all play you know music for them. My torture is I, I just want to use all tape machines. There will always be like one at least. I said, well, let's have some fun. I'm going to just do all tape. I'm going to use four machines. One is for like effects and time delays and loops and things like that. And the other three I'm just going to play with. But it's like it's like juggling hot knives. They're unforgiving. You're in and you got to mix it in. Otherwise, you're not coming back and you're going to wonder where that song is going to go and how much time you got left on it. And it was, but it was always, you know, it was always fun for me. I, I love the challenge of it, you know. And then for people to actually hear what the things that sound like on tape mm. versus what the song actually sounds like. And I had people run up to me, all the producers with their song playing from the real to real. I'm like, how did you make it sound like that? It sounds huge. How are you doing that? And I was like, I just put it to tape. If you hit it hot enough, that the right, it has this this, this uh, spot. Where if you hit tape, it has a sweet spot. If you hit it just right, it's like, whoa. It just it, it becomes its own entity, its own harmonic animal. That's so cool. Yeah, again, like digital, like as we're in this digital I mean, age. They have, they have things that emulate it and all these things, but it's just, it's almost mm -hmm. like if you put on a record, you, you haven't heard a record for the first time, and you hear the channel separation, or you hear just the, the warmth of the record. When I say warmth, it's like, I mean, like, you know, you hear like, the personality of the actual physical thing. It's like you hear you know, where the, the needle's hitting it, the azimuth, the dust on it, the, the imperfection, rather than it being this pristine thing. And, and that's what happens when you play some of these things back to the tape. It, it becomes um, very different. It becomes its own personality. It doesn't, it's not the sterile, straight thing. If there's something that happens, even with the speed that you record the tape at or the, or the formula of the tape, the bias of the tape, the high end does something. The, the, the width of the, the song becomes wider. It just, it just starts to like, it's beefier. And it's just, it just sounds like a, it's own incident. And that's what I love about it. When I put something to tape, and I did this on like my, um, my Facebook page just kind of explain, because people always ask me, like, why are you doing this with tape? So I actually had, you know, I showed exactly why. So first of all, there's a picture on this thing. I can mix with it. I just don't hit the button and it sinks or it's the same speed. None of that. So what happens is when you, I had it so it's like, you can still go to my Facebook page and find it. Every once in a while I'll put it up. It says tape. It says source. And then you hit the button and it says tape. And you can hear the difference right away. It's like, okay, this is what, what it sounds like. This is what it sounds like on tape. And I can A, B it back and forth and immediately you can hear it. It's like, even through the phone, you can hear it. It's just like, it sounds like something that's not mastered, and it is mastered, to something that's superior. Yeah, it really, like, I don't know, so when I start to think about, like, the things that we lose with, mm -hmm. like, streaming and with digital and MP3 and all this stuff, like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I'm like, you know, what am I, what am I not hearing or, like, what am I yeah. missing? Um, yeah, it just becomes very real. And it's real or real, but it becomes a very real thing. It becomes tangible. It doesn't just exist in some kind of di digital stream. It becomes this physical entity all to itself. Mm. Can I ask one last question? Sure. Cool. Th thanks for taking all this time with us. This is, well, this is an interesting conversation. I didn't get a chance to actually voice a lot of these things. I'm so thank you. I, I'm glad I try I try not to ask the same questions, but you never know. You never know like what you've been asked the last time or Oh, whatever. I mean, but each answer it depends on who's asking it. It comes out a bit different. Uh, and the depth of what I'm saying as well. But, yeah. Uh okay. This one's simple but uh excited to hear. Um what like what are some younger and newer producers that you're excited about right now? Oh, Wow, there's a lot. I mean, one of my favorite, I mean, God, I can't see the thing is if I start naming some of them, forget others, they're going to be a problem. But um, Dennis Quinn is one of my favorites. He's one of my closest friends. Um, another, same thing, they're from Amsterdam. Another is a really good group. Um, Lupe Fuentes, I mean, she's a genius. 
I absolutely love her. She's one of my favorite best friends. Um, Jesus, um, baby Roland. I'm actually going to see him today. It's his birthday. He's, he's from a group called Voyeur. Um, Disclosure is always one of my favorites too. I bet they're not so new anymore, but I love those guys. They're, they're, they're geniuses as well. They're, they're nerds just like me, so I love them. Um, um, let me see. I'm waiting for her to do production, Naomi. I mean, a lot of these guys, believe it or not, I have them in a lot of my shows opening up or warming up for me. Like, I'm doing this thing now called Chaos Theory, and they're um, getting to play and open up for me. I mean, there's a lot of female DJs that are absolutely great, incredible. Um, yeah, but I'm very optimistic about the younger generation coming in. And I, mean, I could sit here, this will be the whole interview we've just been saying. How many people I absolutely admire and love, you know, Josh Butler is another one, I love him. Um, you know, somebody's going to be bad at me for forgetting him. Lola Purple, I've always been one of my favorites. Um, I don't know, but you can kind of just look at the lineup I'm on with some of these people, and you can see how many people I actually absolutely admire and, and uh, want to make sure that they have a, a, a great time going into this stuff as well. You know, but they're, they're all like, you know, young. You know, and I have a very, very uh, amazing you know, outlook on this. Like, there's another another guy I just met re recently, Bradley Zero. I'm not sure how long he's been in production, but he's had his first um, set with um, his, his label, his first year anniversary with this new club he's got going. And, um, you know, he just became my new younger brother overnight. You know, we're playing one party, so now we talk all the time. Um, Leighton Moody. My younger brother, you know, he's in South Africa and just doing amazing parties, and I love him. I can just go on and on and on and on and on. You know, it's just, it'll be another hour of me just naming people from the younger generation that I absolutely love. And but I, my, my whole other, you know, side of the family on my dad's side, we're all DJs and producers. And it's just, you know, we, we just all come together and do stuff, you know. And there are a lot of people I really love that, you know, I, I, looked up to when they were DJing before, and I'm getting them out of retirement. So like Merlin Bob is, is back, you know, DJing again, and he's opened Shelter back up. So for me, that was like the biggest accomplishment I could have ever hoped for. You know, I get to play with, you know, someone who's fired me, you know, and we're just you know, doing it all over again and together again. So You got a big family. <laughs> huge. Very, very huge. And I'm, I'm extremely supportive and I, I try to make sure that everybody looks out for each other. You know? I, I think this is a music that should be shared and loved together. You know, it's a community. I've never, ever tried to be better than anyone. I just tried to be the best me I could. And um, we've all tried to make a scene. I never cared, cared about myself. I'll go into a club and I want to make sure everybody's okay. I want to make sure everybody's taken care of. And that, that's just always been me. You know, anybody needs anything while I'm at the club, I'm setting it up for everybody. I'm making sure all the firmware and the, and the CDJs are right. I'm making sure everybody's, you know, everything is the sound is right for everybody. And, you know, I'm just that way. I mean, if you ask any engine, I always go into sound check too, which is the thing for me. I try to make sure everything is right in the club so it doesn't kill anyone's ears. And everything sonically sounds correct. And, you know, it's just, that's the one thing I, I'm exhausted from going place to place, but I always try to make sure that I always do a sound check. And for that, I'm very infamous, because you know, it takes hours sometimes to get it right if something's wrong. You know, but in the end, it, it works out really nicely, because then everybody can play everything they want to play, and it sounds good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. Oh, you're very welcome. I really appreciate it, and yeah, all, all the all the time, all the really inspiring answers, and um, oh, there's so many layers to all of these crazy stories. And like I said, every single song, it has something. <laughs>